Welcome to the first Northwest Robotics Symposium. Um, I want to tell you a little bit about uh, how we decided to do this event, the kind of short history. Uh, so when I uh, first became a faculty here at UDAP, I had just turned out OSU's offer and uh, came still coming to the Northwest. Um, I met a colleague, this was at a conference, and they were, you know, two colleagues were talking and saying, okay, I'll see you in a couple months at the Northeast Robotics Symposium. And I was like, oh, I should look up the Northwest version of this and go to it now that, you know, I'm faculty. And I looked it up and there was nothing, you know, there was no history of uh, Northwest version. So it kind of planted the seed of like, yeah, maybe I should do it. Or I, I should find someone to do it. <laughs> um, over the years, you know, things came up. It was busy times. Uh, I really didn't get around to it. I, I pitched it to some folks. Nobody really picked it up. Um, my students started asking, can I go to the SoCal uh, Robotics Symposium? Can I go to the Bay Area Robotics Symposium, etc." So it was kind of really hurting that we didn't have it. Finally, Texas did it this year. I'm like, we really have to do this. Uh, so that's uh, where we are. Um, so uh, we actually piloted it right before the uh, pandemic. We had a uh, UW-wide robotics research symposium right in this space when you know it was brand new. Still, you could kind of smell the paint uh, around here, and it, it was really nice. We definitely intended to continue do it the next year and then eventually expand to Northwest Robotics Symposium, but um, of course the pandemic came. Um, so uh, after the pandemic, you know. It was the question of do we do UW or just go for it. We had some, I think, extra reasons to really go for it. Uh, we had missed several years of conferences, uh, so that was really one of the big incentives for this. Um, and you know, you guys know you didn't get very much notice for it, but we were like, we're going for it. You know, we'll figure it out. So. Um, Especially, you know, in the past two years, those of you who are new students, um, you, you've been to conferences, maybe presented a, a, a paper, uh, but that virtual experience is really not representative of, of a conference. Uh, so big incentive in this was to uh, make up for that, the lost uh, opportunities to network, uh, to give talks, uh, and to make connections with, with folks. Of course, you know, why in the first place, we, even if we didn't have the pandemic, we did want to do this. And the big incentive there is to make more regional connections. Uh, there's more opportunities for us to have collaborations uh, based on things that are happening in our region. So, um, of course, that was still uh, uh, an incentive to do this. Um, so, uh, we have lots of participants. We were really excited by uh, people's responses. Uh, surprisingly, we have more people from OSU <laughs> presenting than UW. Um, I think, you know, it's, it's a bit of this curse, like when things are happening locally, you don't really uh, disengage and like get excited about it. So, uh, but uh, people will be in and out during the day, so hopefully we have good, good coverage. Um, but lots of other institutions, fewer people, of course, but um, we're, we're really excited that we have people from industry, people from different universities, um, and uh, yeah, uh, and many, many more. Uh, lots of local startups, uh, different departments across UW represented, etc. All right, so let me introduce the, my co-organizers. Uh, so Nick Walker, sitting over there, he did most of the work. So you go thank him. Uh, he's going to be giving a, a talk later on as well. So talk to him about all of that. Um, we have Kartik, uh, our star postdoc. Myself, uh, Sawyer Fuller is at a, a thesis defense. Uh, he'll be back. Uh, he'll be here soon. And then Josh Smith. Uh, so you'll you'll see Nick give a talk, and everybody else will be chairing the session. So please uh, say hi. Uh, and of course, the event uh, could not happen without our uh, amazing staff members. Uh, so Emma Notkin, you probably said hi in the morning. Uh, really took care of everything. And, uh, and we have our production team. So one thing we didn't want to share in advance because it might change your mind about coming, but we're going to be uh, streaming the event. So um, if you have folks who couldn't make it, go to the website. There's a link there for the uh, stream and uh, they can join in and see your talk. Um, so yeah, our production team is taking care of that and they're all there. 
and Brian. Brian was the uh, kind of person helping us mostly with that. So here's the schedule. Uh, this is also on the website. I won't go through it, but uh, we basically have talks. The format we decided on was to have people give talks that are from recent conferences, so talks that didn't get a chance to be presented in person. Um, and it's a mix of you know, grad students, uh, postdocs, faculty presenting. But we also have a poster session, so our posters are being set up over there. Um, and they're already up, so uh, in any breaks, go and take a tour, say hi, um, etc. cetera. We um, have some demos. Unfortunately, the one demo we were doing, our robot broke, it's shipped, etc. It's not happening, but um, our, our lab manager, Celeste, will be giving a tour of the robotics uh, space, which is in this building. Um, but also, I heard uh, OSU folks brought a robot, uh, so we have a, a, a time uh, specifically for that. I think it will be there will be a good audience for that. Um, and then at the end, we also put a, a, a town hall. That's really we don't really know what what it's going to be about, but we definitely want to chat. Uh, of course, so for me, I hope you get the most out of this. Uh, for me, my goal is to meet someone new from every institution, uh, but also big goal is figuring out who's going to be organizing uh, this next year. Uh, we're going to have a very uh, thorough bidding process, etc. No, uh, joking. So we really, if you want to do this, it's yours. Uh, we're happy to, uh, you know, help with any kind of ideas, etc. But uh, I saw a hand already. <laughs> Okay, yes. Um, so with that, I'll hand it to Josh, who's going to chair the first session. All right, well, <clears throat> in the first session, we've got, uh, you know, uh, papers that seem to be sort of weighted towards HRI, but uh, not, not completely. Uh, so each talk is supposed to be eight minutes with two minutes for questions. So I'll mostly just keep an eye on the time in case anybody goes way over. Uh, the first speaker is Naomi Fitter, Assistant Professor of Robotics in the Share Lab in Mechanical, Industrial Mechanic and Manufacturing Engineering at OSU. So Naomi. All right. Cool. So. In the comedy world, you would call me the opener. I think they put me first to wake everyone up. We're gonna get started with some robot comedy. Um, as was mentioned in the nice introduction, I am Naomi Fitter, an assistant professor of robotics at Oregon State University. And I'm presenting to you today, comedians in cafes getting data, evaluating timing and adaptivity in real world robot comedy performance, which would have been an in-person talk at HRI 2020, which uh, unexpectedly went virtual. And this was also a best paper uh, at that conference. So get excited, raise your expectations high. Hopefully I can deliver on, on everything you'd hope for this paper. So um, the, the background, the premise here is that the intersection of AI and comedy goes back decades and decades, but the state of the art can still leave something to be desired. We can see this, for example, in an interaction with Siri. Tell me a joke. Oh no, it's very quiet. This is the quietest video. Siri says, why did the spaghetti go to bed? It was pasta bedtime. So this is kind of an example of the state of the art, which we like because we're nerds and computer scientists, but John is not amused. And a key problem here is that current strategies for humorous AI usually rely on puns and a few other types of formulaic joke to create humor. So don't you hate it when, you're, when your AI isn't funny enough or your robot isn't funny enough? Don't you hate that? We'll use some comedy cliches throughout this talk. So this gap led us to wonder about better robot comedy. And human comedians have tactics for engaging with the crowd, using good timing, using responses, often known as tags to address how people are responding to jokes. And accordingly, we wondered if we could design robot comedy with the same premises in mind. So that was kind of the core idea behind this paper. And in addition to my day job as a comedian, if you can't tell from how well I'm waking you up and engaging you, I'm a semi-professional uh, comedian as well. So 
I sought to instill the robot that, that we were working on in this paper with some of the typical strategies that I would use in a comedic performance. And these include jokes with setups and punchlines, uh, unsurprisingly good timing strategies. The state of the art, as you almost saw in the previous video, is kind of pre-timed uh, formulaic jokes. We want the robot to be more adaptive. Post-joke tags, maybe the robot can play on the audience. If they don't laugh, make a joke about that or explain the joke. If they do laugh, maybe capitalize on that with a similar joke. And usually in comedy clubs, they don't have much patience for much audio or AV setup. So we wanted to have onboard audio only sensing, no extra sensors in the environment, just running off the sensors onboard the robot. So we put all this together into a now robotic comedian as, as others have done before me. And the only uh, extra layer adaptation that I needed to do is hold up a microphone next to this robot in comedy performance. So we can take it to a comedy club. It can just kind of get on the stage and go uh, good enough for impatient bookers to ask me back again, hopefully. So now that we had an uh, autonomous robotic comedian with abilities inspired by human comedians, the next step was to evaluate these skills. Does it really matter if we have good timing, if we have adaptive tags for our jokes? And live performance in pre-existing comedy venues offers a fitting and natural experimental setting. We've already got kind of an agent, usually a human, but now sometimes a robot on stage performing to an audience. And people naturally respond to jokes by laughing or not laughing or maybe groaning, uh, giving different types of audio-based feedback. So we decided to use this setting to evaluate our robot's humor strategies in kind of a, a naturalistic, valid environment. And we ran two open world studies uh, following this line of thinking. Our first open world study considered the effects of appropriate robot timing or not while telling jokes. Many AI assistants, as I've alluded to before, use a fixed period, kind of fixed rigid timing when telling jokes. So for a bad timing mode, we used a five minute pause after every joke as sort of a, a bad, we thought, timing ad adaptivity method. And for a more appropriate timing, we tried what we called appropriate timing. We thought that the robot should wait until it thought it would be audible and then go on to tell the next joke. Uh, and we accomplished this with a little bit of audio thresholding, which is described more in the paper. I won't go into it too much now, but I'm happy to chat about it later. So overall, we ran 12 performances in bad timing mode, 10 real world performances with the robot in the good timing mode. This was a, a between, um, between performances, I suppose, study. So we could compare the two. And here's a video demonstration of each condition real quick. You can probably tell from looking at me that I'm from the valley. <laughs> Silicon Valley. <laughs> You can probably tell from looking at me that I'm from the valley. <laughs> Silicon Valley. So we can see an example of each bad and, and hopefully more appropriate timing. And here's a clip showcasing the timing findings and a little more robot comedy to wake you up this morning. This one's for all my robots out there. <laughs> So funny. <laughs> you guys are great. When I told the joke to Alexa, she said, I'm sorry, I didn't get that. <laughs> nice. So, yeah, you can tell looking across the room who's old enough to recognize that sort of printer noise. <laughs> and uh, I'm glad you enjoyed the, um, the tag of that joke. So human raters labeled each joke's success as positive, lukewarm, or negative based on audio of the performance. And we did tests comparing the performance across the two, finding that somewhat unsurprisingly, if you're a fan of comedy or know anything about comedy, good timing makes a robot significantly funnier. So that's great. Um, a second condition we were studying or concerned about too though was the existence of tags following jokes to kind of capitalize on success of jokes or play on, on failure of jokes. So for the second factor, we did another set of real-world deployments of the robot comedian, and this time we compared non-adaptive, 
So this is sort of just set, telling a, a set of jokes in sequence, no adaptation based on how the crowd likes it, versus adaptive, where we looked at how the audience responded to the joke and tried to capitalize that, again, with autonomous audio sensing strategies that are described more in the paper. So these were our two conditions going into the second open world study. This one was a little smaller, but still helped us to get an idea of initial performance of this sort of adaptive robot comedian tactic. And here again, I'll show a video demonstration of each condition to help you understand. Don't you hate it when you're trying to solve inverse kinematic sequations to pick up a cup, and then you get error 453, no solution found? Don't you hate that? <laughs> <laughs> Don't you hate that? <laughs> You can see those naturalistic settings and enjoy those here. Uh, and then again, so you can see more robot comedy and also the results of the second real world study. Here's a clip showcasing the adaptivity findings. Are impossible. I'm thinking of getting plastic surgery where they epoxy more plastic to my exoskeleton. You see, because I am a robot, I'm made of plastic. So there you can see the classic explaining the joke. In this case, across entire performances, we didn't actually see the adaptivity making a significant difference in increasing crowd response overall. But if you looked at the individual joke level, as is showcased here too, uh, we saw that in almost all cases, that sort of adaptive tag increased the perception of a previously unsuccessful joke. Um, I'll wrap up here in comedy terms. I see I'm running the light and uh, putting us behind schedule already. But the public performance part of this work has been fun too. We've run a series of robot comedy shows called Singu Hilarity in Corvallis and in the Bay Area. And I'd love to do one up in Seattle if anyone organizes that up here. Uh, and overall, our, our robot headlines or performs alongside human performers, usually at least based on my observation with similar levels of comedic performance. So this is sort of a, a fun foray into that space and initial results, trying to evaluate or start to evaluate adaptive timing and tags for robotic comedians. And I hope it, it woke you up successfully this morning. Uh, thanks for your attention. I've been Naomi Fitter, and I head the SHARE Lab down at Oregon State University. Thanks so much, Naomi. Next is Amir Helmi from Naomi's lab. Um, and we are a little over time, so we won't do a question. Uh, so Amir, why don't you take it away? All right, hey everyone. I don't have robot comedy, but I have bubbles and other things that are fun too. Um, okay. My name is Amir Homi. I'm a PhD candidate in the Oregon State University Share Lab. Uh, today I'll be discussing the paper, Design of an Assistive Robot for Infant Mobility Interventions. Uh, this was previously presented at Roman. Uh, so approximately 7% of infants experience developmental disabilities, and this number is continuing to rise. Um, so mobility disabilities, which is a fun term, uh, affect not only physical development, but also social and cognitive development. So early mobility interventions that focus on uh, expanding mobility can also have compounding value for helping with social and cognitive development as well. So basically, we want to um, combine our assistive robot that we're uh, designing and with body weight supported free play or some other form of free play to help uh, children kind of work on this development. And basically, I'm going to go through an exploratory study that we did to kind of find out, is our robot actually going to encourage children to move around to get some physical activity? Um, so like I mentioned, exploratory free play study, and then uh, basically I'll talk about that study and then some stuff that we're doing currently that's kind of expanding upon that. So this is our assistive robot. We designed it in coordination with the Oregon State Social Mobility Lab. They're experts in kinesiology and child movement, so we leverage them for help on what children might enjoy. So one of the main features is our custom reward stack, which is the big orange cone that has like lights, uh, sounds, and bubbles, which are a lot of fun features. Uh, to help encourage movement. Uh, we put it on a TurtleBot 2 base, which is running uh, Raspberry Pi with Ross and Ubuntu. 
Uh, we've since done some upgrades, so it's a lot more flexible and a lot more uh, modular. Um, we also added a safety cage, so that prevents the robot from tipping over, because children like to be destructive. Um, and like I mentioned, the robot is very modular, so we can swap out different pieces. If you want to remove the bubble module, for example, we can place something else. We also have some other cool features that we've been working on, like a ball launcher, so we can pop out the whole uh, system and put in a ball launching device, which is a lot of fun as well. So now, I want to talk more about the study that we did, the exploratory study. So we ran this playgroup in conjunction with the, the same lab, the Oregon State Social Mobility Lab. Uh, they have a giant playgroup that basically they hosted a bunch of kiddos. They would come in and play for an hour, uh, free play sessions. They could just do whatever they wanted. Um, so the play space included a bunch of different kinds of toys. There's like a slide and a ball pit and among, uh, amongst other kinds of really fun toys. And the robot was also in there as well. We used an overhead camera, which is kind of obvious, uh, to capture activity for post hoc analysis. And then we had the robot in there as well. So the robot use differed by phase. During the baseline, the robot was present but didn't do anything. It was not functional. And then during the treatment sessions, the robot can move around and deploy like the rewards. And for each kiddo, we went up to them and at least used each reward once. So like a lights, a bubbles, a sounds, or a combination, at least once per kiddo per session. So we had six participants in this session. Five of them were female. They were all typically developing, so no mobility aids. Um, and the range of ages was one, point, one and a half years to about six and a half years. Uh, we used a within subject design, which means that each, all the kiddos saw both conditions. So there was the baseline they, when the robot's not working, and then the treatment when the robot is active. Uh, we had seven weekly sessions, so four of them baseline, three of them treatment. We were going to have a fourth treatment session, and then COVID happened. So we, couldn't, we had to cancel that, unfortunately. And like I mentioned, for the baseline, robots powered off, but it is there, so they could like walk up to it and touch it. But then uh, during treatment sessions, it's active and driving around and having uh, a blast. So let's talk about our results really quick. Uh, so we used video annotation. Basically, we had expert coders kind of go through the overhead video and mark down different kinds of activities the kiddos were doing. Um, and they basically looked uh, for specific activities such as looking, touching, pushing or pulling, following or approaching the robot. So they would mark those uh, in intervals. And basically, our results showed that in the treatment session, there was a, a, a rise in activity each time um, for each session. However, over the course of uh, repeated sessions, there was a bit of a drop off. So like the first time around, the robot's really, really interesting. And then it kind of drops off a bit. But at the very end, those values remain higher than the baseline phase. So they were definitely more interested in the robot than when it wasn't active, which makes sense. Um, basically, this, we wanted to do an exploratory study. Does the robot have any value whatsoever? And then how do we expand upon that? And how do we really actually leverage the functionality of a robot to, do, to have a lot of fun and to encourage physical activity and movement? So um, this was a big collaboration between roboticists and kinesiology, kinesiology experts. Uh, the, the design was, was help. We had, we had a lot of help making the design really fun. Um, we noticed some positive trends in mediated free play. So basically the robot in, in a big play space and having a lot of fun. Um, and our big next steps, which I'm going to show some of what we've done already, is to add more variety. So how do we uh, swap out modules to have, uh, make the robot more interesting and flexible? And then adding in autonomy. So um, in this study, the robot was teleoperated. But how do we add in some, some autonomy level? And how do we add in decision making as well? So this is the current state of the robot. And we got a video as well of a current study that we're running where a kiddo is playing with bubbles and having a blast. So we've added some additional safety features because children were like tugging on wires and trying to get at the Raspberry Pi. Uh, we added some fun features. You can see googly eyes on the bottom. Um, we also added a ball launcher, which is also on the bottom there. So they can load in the ball, and it can shoot, and they can go chase it. Um, and then we've also been working on some semi-autonomous modes. So basically, the robot will navigate itself in space. And then we control still when using like bubbles or lights and sounds. So in the video on the top, it's actually driving itself. Uh, but we're controlling like the use of bubbles to hopefully bring the kiddo close to the robot. Um, so that's, yeah, really fun. Uh, the, and we also started a, a new batch of studies, like I mentioned. So we're doing one-on-one -on -one robot interaction uh, in, a, in a play space, uh, just seeing if the robot is continuing to encourage physical activity and movement uh, versus when it's powered off. Um, and then last but not least, just talk about some real basic stuff uh, for sensing. So we're currently using LiDAR as our sensing for navigation, which is like, OK. 
Uh, it's pretty. It's it's effective enough uh, in the play space that we're working in because the the walls are pretty easy to navigate around, and toys are generally pretty tall, uh, like big houses and big kitchens. So we can navigate around those pretty well. Um, but if we want to go into full autonomy, we're going to need additional sensing. So we're going to deploy an overhead camera system, which basically uh, enables a user to like draw boxes, and then it will just track the region of interest and feed that information to the robot. And that can be used to kind of tell, OK, there's a kiddo three feet away from me, so I can um, deploy bubbles and then bring them over towards me. Uh, so the combination of these two sensing modes, I think, will help us kind of have uh, full autonomy, full movement. Um, and that's our, that's our next goals after our current study is to see if we can move into that realm as well. Um, yeah, that's it. So thanks for listening. Uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions. I think I went a little fast, so I, I guess I have time for questions. Yeah, <laughs> questions? Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, quick question about the experiment setup. So, the uh, like, is there any gender specific, uh, like, uh, because you said there were five females and one male. Yeah. So, there might be something specific to the gender which is happening. Yeah, um, we're not. We, we didn't notice anything in particular in, the, in our exploratory study. However, we're hoping to kind of balance our future studies so that we can see if there's any difference. Um, especially at that young of an age, it may, it may or may not uh, be super duper relevant. It's un, it's unclear at this point, at least. But yeah, I think it was mostly comes down to recruitment and what we could find uh, who would be available to to come play. Yeah. I guess the question I had is, will you be? Is a, a future step to do this study with? children with developmental yes. disabilities? Yes, absolutely. So we have some collaborators that we're working with, um, and then we're hoping to reduce some recruitment in that realm as well. Uh, we are also hoping to kind of combine that with like a body weight support harness so that children can move around in, a, in the same kind of play space, um, and the robot can be a kind of fun tool for, for movement. Um, All right, another question. Are the batches of kids the same every time you test, like in every trial, or? Yeah, uh, you mean like? Every every weekly session, yeah. yes, it's the same kid, yeah, same children. Um, so that's yeah, we yeah. every every weekly session, the same kids come and play. Uh, in our one on one, it's it's just one child coming in and playing. Um, same thing. So like follow up on that, like what do you find? How is the effect of like since in the previous week the child knows about the robot, and then what's the effect in the later weeks? Yeah, for sure. Um, so at least in this exploratory study, we notice some drop off of interest. However, um, what I've noticed in the most recent study we're doing, children actually come in and are like ready to play with the robot. They're like, all right, why isn't the robot active yet? Like, can we play already? Um, they'll even like walk up to it, kind of shake it a little bit. So I think there's actually a, a pretty big interest in like coming and playing with the robot and having a good time. They, they really seem to enjoy it. All right, thank you. Uh, okay. Ethan, Ethan Gordon is the next speaker and Looks like he's here. He works in Sid Srinivas's lab, uh, who is Boeing Endowed Professor of Computer Science and Electrical Engineering here at UW. Take it away, Ethan. All right, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Ethan Gordon, and I'll be talking about leveraging post hoc context for faster learning in bandit settings with applications in robot assisted feeding. So, why the application of robot assistive feeding? Well, robot assistive feeding, or assistive feeding, or feeding in general, is a activity of daily living. It's something we all have to do every single day. But there's uh, a million people, at least in the US alone, that have uh, mobility impairments that prevent them from being able to carry out these ADLs. Now, caregivers, as you can see here, are awesome. Um, but care recipients can still report feeling a lack of control, lack of independence, uh, embarrassed or rushed, because this is a time-consuming task, uh, and it does uh, have a present a burden for uh, caregivers. And so a robot assisted feeding system um, would uh, allow these caregivers to have a little bit more time to do other tasks as well. Um, so let's me present the assistive dexterous arm, the personal robotics lab's solution to robot assistive feeding. Um, Ada, Ada is her name. Um, so uh, this sort, of, this video here sort of demonstrates that uh, assistive feeding is a multifaceted process. There's actually acquiring the food, the timing of when to uh, bring it to the uh, user's face, and the actual transfer. Uh, and here's where I give away that I kind of snuck into this HRI focus session because this work focuses on bite acquisition, the least HRI element of this work, um, element of this problem. So uh, specifically, the problem of picking up food items that we may have not seen before. 
So why can't we just throw this in Lake Mujoka or something and uh, model everything and throw all of the problem? Well, the two problems. First, food is incredibly diverse. Um, there are 40,000 different food items in the average grocery store, maybe a little less with the supply shortages. Um, I don't buy all of them, but someone does. And so we need to be, have a robot in principle that can be able to pick up all of them. Um, the other issue is food is very hard to model. It's not, uh, food is not rigid. Um, and it's not just deformable in the way cloth is, you know, the topology can break as you're trying to pick it up. So our work looks at a bit of a more black box approach. Um, so previous work modeled the bite acquisition process as a sort of general, what's called a contextual bandit, named after the multi arm bandit because you can think of it explain it as if pulling levers of slot machines um we get some context in this case an image of the food item we take some action that's like the slot machine lever and we get some reward uh binary reward in this case uh a reward of one if we succeed or a reward of zero if we fail to pick up the food item um this by the way importantly is called bandit feedback that's also uh based on the name uh, contextual bandit because we only get to see the feedback for um for the action that we took. We don't get to see the counterfactual, what would have happened if we took a different action, and that'll become important later. Uh, specifically, our previous work looked at modeling byte acquisition as a linear contextual bandit. We had uh, a model called SpaNet, which was already designed to uh, convert food item images into visual features, and the last layer of that network was linear. So that linear layer becomes our linear policy that we update every time. So we get the context picture of the food item, we run it through this network SpaNet um, to get features, we use that to get a single action, select a single action, take that action, see how well it does. Now, the limitations of this approach, and one of the main limitations, is that you can have visually dissimilar food items that nonetheless can use the same manipulation strategy. So, for example, rigid items could require both require a high force. I mean, grapes and cherry tomatoes are basically uh, the same thing with a different color. Um, kiwi and banana are both soft, and so if you try to skewer them vertically, they'll just fall right off the fork. Um, so the key insight of this work is that we can leverage multimodal context collected during manipulation to improve this acquisition success. So we have our visual context here that we get before manipulation, and then during manipulation, we get, because of our force torque sensor that it's used to prevent us from stabbing through the table, we actually can read the forces and torque values during this uh, acquisition phase. So what we get is a byte acquisition being a contextual bandit augmented with this post hoc context to hopefully get us to learn faster how best to pick up food items. So let's just run through the system diagram quickly. Um, so we detect food items individually uh, through an off-the-shelf uh, retina net. Uh, we run it through SpawnNet, as I described before, to get the visual features, and then we use our, a linear model that's updated online um, to sort of get the expected success rate of all the possible skewering actions we can take. These are high-level actions, you know, skewer vertically, skewer at an angle. Uh, we then select a single action and get that banded feedback by executing it and seeing whether we pick up the food or not. Here is where we leverage some more previous work. Um, which that also done uh, in this lab by uh, some of the co-authors of the paper um, that showed that we can actually get a lot of information from this haptic, from the haptics, the forces and the torques that we get during acquisition. Um, the first 70 milliseconds is enough to classify food items into these four categories you see, hard skin, hard, medium, and soft. Um, just a two-layer multi, just a two-layer perceptron. Um, so we took this perceptron, added another linear layer to it, called it haptic net, um, and this is what is the post hoc context. Um, we collect the force torque data during manipulation. Uh, we run it through haptic net to get the haptic features. And we have a second linear model on the context that we then jointly, multiply, uh, jointly optimize with our visual context in order to more quickly learn which action is the best. So to kind of give a, some mathematical intuition as to why this actually provides an improvement, even if the post hoc context is coming after the action selection, uh, consider this model where the reward or the loss is simultaneously a linear function of the context and the post hoc context. Um, in that case, if we have some sort of uh, regression function to figure out what those optimal weights theta and phi are, we can just run normal least squares on both the context data and the post hoc data. But importantly, because they should give the same result, we have this, uh, we optimize it under this constraint that it gives the same result, importantly, across all time steps. So remember before, we didn't get the counterfactual information, and now we kind of do. If the post hoc, in, in principle, if the post hoc uh, model is perfect, then it provides all of the, co the counterfactual information for the, re the uh, regular context. Um, so all we need is an easy post hoc model. Um, 
what are examples of where it's easy. So I'm going to run through this a little quick because these are toy examples to show uh, the improvements we can expect if this post hoc uh, data is particularly rich or particularly easy to analyze. So first, this post hoc data could be of a lower dimensionality. So in this example here, we see that if the, the post hoc vector is 33 times smaller, despite having the same information as the context uh, vector, we can get significantly improved performance in any learning algorithm. Um, additionally, it's also possible that the post hoc model is just easier to learn. So this is an example on the MNIST data set where the context was just the picture of the number, try to classify the number, and the post hoc was just constructed to be noiseless and linear, so very easy to learn. You see we learn it perfectly in uh, 500 steps. And you see that allows us to get the context model, the performance on just the context model, uh, to be significantly closer to the optimal much faster which would in turn lead to an increased performance, reduced regret in the bandit literature. So uh, anyway, after all of that, we took this augmented post hoc context, there we go, um, algorithm, and we put it on our robot, testing against eight different types of food items. Um, these food items, I don't know why the video is having so much trouble, uh, but I think you get the idea. These food items are classified in four different haptic categories. So ideally, rather than having to try all six actions on all eight food items, we'd be able to try all six actions on all four haptic categories and get that 50% improvement. We'd, we'd know 50% faster what is the optimal action for each food item. Um, we didn't quite get 50%, uh, but we did show a across uh, three 60 trial episodes, we were able to show a 20 to 25% improvement, I think a 22% improve, improvement. Um, and you can see here these examples with the two soft food items, the banana and the kiwi. So there is sort of some sharing, the haptic information is sort of shared between these two food items, allowing the algorithm to know what the best action is for each one without having to try all actions on all food items. So that's really the crux of this work right here. Uh, assistive feeding in general is very technically challenging. I'm over eight minutes. Great, then I'll uh, close it out quick. Um, byte acquisition, byte transfer. Transfer depends on acquisition. There's a lot of future work in this space. All of our uh, data set and our hardware um, uh, is open. Uh, our hub is robotfeeding.io. If you're interested in this problem, highly uh, recommend giving that a look. Huge thanks to all my co-authors, uh, Sue Megtopo, Kevin, and Sid, and the Personal Robotics Lab in general for the support and guidance. And if I'm not too far over, I'll take questions. Yeah. Great. Anybody have a quick question? Yeah, there we go. For the haptic feedback, are you just using the force sensing in the arm itself, or do you have to add additional uh, sensing capability to the arm? Yeah, so we do have extra sensing capability in the fork itself, this uh, six off force torque sensor. Okay. All right. Well, thank you very much. And next we have Nick Walker, who's a PhD student here at UW CSC. Uh, his advisor is Maya Chekmerk. One day, you're going to turn to a robot and ask it to go get something for you. And maybe as it rolls away to go do that, off to the kitchen, it's going to stop and it's going to do something else. Maybe it's going to take a look in the recycling bin. And at that moment, a bunch of things might run through your head. You might be thinking, well, this robot is not very good at its job. Maybe it's being nosy. But would you think that it's being curious? See, there's a lot of reasons we'd want a robot to do things like this, check out parts of its environment, explore on its own, have some kind of intrinsic motivation. Robot learning people are all into this. But it bears asking, what do people think of an intrinsically motivated robot learner? What do people think of a curious robot and the actions that it might take? So this is a project that we, we worked on and presented first in March 2020 at HRI uh, with our friends at UC Santa Cruz. To investigate this, we set up a simple toy domain where the user asks the robot to check the contents of some box. It's always that box in the middle there, E. The robot goes, checks the box, and it comes back and it reports the contents. So you can think of this as a very simple environment where it's fully specified by rewarding the agent for getting the information it was asked to get. But you can easily see how we could change the behavior by rewarding the agent for checking some other box or getting any new information. And all of our studies essentially explore uh, variations and conditions of how we could play with this model of the environment. So we physically realized this here in the building downstairs actually and recorded videos of our robot always being told to go visit a box which happens to be the one in the middle. The robot rolls off 
and it checks the box. And meanwhile, the people viewing these videos were told that the label that was being put on the whiteboard would represent the next task that the robot would be asked to do. So the human on the screen manages that, and the robot will go check the box it was asked to, and in different conditions, it'll do different things. Maybe it'll come straight back. In other conditions, it comes, and in this one, it just checks one box on the way back. And all of the videos end with the robot coming back and at least reporting the contents of the box it was asked to check. So all of our experiments then follow this format. We show people a bunch of these videos with different variations, and we ask them to respond to some items rating the robot's competence and curiosity and to explain the, the, anything in their own words about what they were feeling. In the first experiment, we compared that simple condition against a baseline where the robot doesn't detour. But we also wondered, well, what if the robot has to detour across the room? And so we, we had one condition where the robot does that. We also thought, well, maybe the order might matter. What if we swapped the order of the detour so it happened before the robot even did the thing it was asked? And what we see here, where these charts are showing essentially more or less competent, more or less curious, is that these detours do get perceived as curios um, expressions of curiosity, but people don't like them, or at least they perceive them as incompetence, even though they add just a few seconds onto the robot's task. And the details of these detours don't matter so much. They're roughly indistinguishable. People perceive them as curious, but less competent. And they'll attribute agency to this, saying things like it has robot ADHD, or that it's making decisions on its own to go do something. And they do point it out as looking curious, but overall they just don't like that it's doing something it's not told to do. And that's a fair point, but it made us think, if the point of this curiosity is to eventually be useful, maybe if we showed them that it was going to be useful, they'd like it more, or they'd think that it was more competent. And we were able to realize this condition by simply taking the exact same video and changing out the label that they were told was going to be the next task that the robot would be asked to do. In one condition, that label doesn't correspond to what the robot detours to. In another condition, it does. And we call that the curiosity paying off. And uh, we compare that against the same baselines. And we also were interested to see what would happen if we had the robot check something that wasn't even a box. We put a trash can in the back of the environment. So what happened then? Well, we, we reproduced the results from that first experiment for the first detour. And people do perceive that action that pays off is more competent and equally as curious. The, the item, the checking something that wasn't a box doesn't really register with people. And we think that this is a sign that there's limits to what people will perceive as curiosity. So you can't just have the robot doing anything. And people rightly pointed out, well, this could have been a coincidence. And this is an important point if you're looking to implement a, a curious robot learner. You can't control when the robot will eventually benefit from the actions it's taking to explore. So it bears asking, what can it do to control how it's being perceived? And we wanted to check if we had that robot provide some explanations about what it's doing. Is this going to make people think that it's more competent, even though it's actually delaying the task just as much? And we accomplished this by taking the same video and just changing the dialogue at the end to add some extra information. And we do things like just tell the, the human on the video what was in the bin that the robot detoured to. So acknowledge the fact that you checked something else and tell them what you saw. Say as much, but then also say that you did it because you were curious. And say as much, but say that you did it because you thought it would be useful. And what we see then is that Providing that extra information on its own is not sufficient. People don't perceive that as meaningfully different than the condition where you don't provide an explanation where, or you don't provide that information. Providing that information and saying that you did it because you're curious, predictably, makes people think that you did it because you're curious. And likewise with saying that you did it for utility. But the key observation here is that providing these explanations is essentially free in this context. And both of these explanation conditions were received better by users. So simply telling people about why you're detouring is an important factor when you're going to make a robot take things, uh, take actions off task. And people were very sympathetic with this robot, 
saying like uh, saying that they thought that this was the true reason for the robot uh, to to be detouring, that it was being honest. And of course, we see even uh, when we look at the data, we see a lot more descriptions of agency to this robot when it says things like it was doing it because it thought it would be useful. So takeaways. If you're going to make a robot that's curious, basically off-task actions are pretty likely to be attributed to some sense uh, an innate intrinsic motivation of curiosity within limits. Uh, so there's uh, a context with the domain that'll be important, which wasn't explored so much in this work. It's likely to not be perceived positively off the bat, but you do have the ability to influence this and mitigate some of these negative perceptions with things like explanations or other transparency mechanisms. So what I hope is that in the future when we have curious robots, it's gonna be in context in a way that makes sense. So when that robot comes back and you're wondering what just happened, you're gonna get an explanation or uh, a situation that's both useful for the robot and that you actually like. And that's it. Thank you. Perfect timing. We have time for a couple of questions. So as a roboticist, you know, if a robot starts veering off and doing something else, I might just go physically walk to it and either stop it or help guide it along or something like that. And I was just wondering if you considered having the robot, like, as it's driving to the other box, being like, oh, wait a minute, like, I'm just going to check this or, you know, have some sort of, like, indication in the moment that it is. I, I, uh, do you have any intuition on, do you think if that would affect the perception? Um, if you think it'll be more competent if it says that or, or not? Yes, I think that is something that um, should be designed into these types of uh, systems that would take off-task actions. For this first exploration, that's much harder to study with a large-scale video kind of situation because we can't control whether people are are going to pick up on specific you know signals that we raise like that as easily as we could for some of these conditions but i, I agree i think it's important that any system that would take these actions would have mechanisms to make them immediately obvious to people how about over here uh, do you have any thoughts on uh, how different modes of communication could influence uh, people's perceptions like Robot speaking versus, you know, light speakers, like R2D2 sort of situations. Sure. I don't personally, though, I know there's a lot of work in HRI on that. We used, we used dialogue here because, again, it was easy for this large scale study. But, for instance, this physical robot, the Curie, doesn't even ship with a voice for some of the reasons that we think about using voice or not in HRI. So, I don't know, particularly in these kinds of curious robots how it would work out, but I, I'm sure it would be different. Okay, uh, sorry, we should, we should end there. Uh, thanks very much. <laughs> and now we have Amal Donavati, uh, who's a PhD student here in the Allen School, and his advisor is also Sid Srinivasa. Hey all. Um, Thanks for coming to this talk. As I was, men as was mentioned, my name is Amal, and I'm co-advised by Maya and Sid. And actually, the question about humans helping the curious robot is actually a perfect segue into this work, which was part of the same broad project, um, the collaboration between UW and UCSC, as the work that Nick presented. So this work is on modeling human helpfulness with individual and contextual factors for robot planning. So consider a robot in an office building. This robot might get lost. It might get knocked over or it might be asked to go to a location it hasn't heard of. In situations like this, the robot can ask human bystanders for help. Yet, the question of who and when to ask for help is quite nuanced. Past work has revealed that a robot that asks for help too much could annoy people, leading them to not help the robot. Similarly, a robot that asks for help at the wrong times could also annoy people, like when the person's busy. However, a robot that asks for help not enough might not be able to complete its task efficiently enough. So in this work, we ask the question, how can a robot model human helpfulness in order to balance the dual objectives of efficiently completing its tasks while minimizing the number of times it asks for help? So 
Um, we consider two types of factors, individual factors and contextual factors. Individual factors are unchangeable and often unobservable attributes of the person, whereas contextual factors are features that embed the person in their broader physical or temporal context. Importantly, this research builds off of two different strains of research. One is the human helpfulness literature, and the state-of-the-art model for human helpfulness focuses only on individual factors. The other train of research is human interruptibility research, and the state of the art on that focuses chiefly on modeling contextual factors. And this work brings these two type of factors together. Our key insight is that effectively planning for a task that involves bystander help requires disaggregating individual and contextual factors, and then explicitly reasoning about the robot's uncertainty over the individual factors. So first, let's discuss why it's important to disaggregate these factors. Consider a robot that needs, to find, needs help finding where it goes, and consider two people, one who's latently helpful and one who's not latently helpful. If the robot sees the person who's not latently helpful, well, its model should predict that this person's unlikely to help it, and the robot shouldn't even bother asking. If it sees a person who's latently helpful, well, the model should predict that they'll help it, right? But if this person is busy at that time, the model should recognize that even though this is a helpful person, because of this contextual factor, they're unlikely to help me right now, and I shouldn't waste my social capital by asking them for help. Second, let's consider why it's important to reason about the robot's uncertainty over these individual factors. As was mentioned, these individual factors are all often unobservable, right? Like, the robot doesn't know, doesn't have a number beforehand for how latently helpful a person is. But this can be inferred over time through the robot's history of interactions with the same person. If there's a robot in our office building, it's going to see each of us multiple times. And therefore, by maintaining a probability distribution over the person's likely helpfulness and updating it over time, the robot can improve its help requesting behavior. So we ran the study during COVID. Um, we couldn't actually do an in-person deployment. So instead, we developed this online office environment that was actually based off of the second floor of this building. Um, so the user is told that they are an IT admin in this building, going to de uh, clean viruses off of computers, do software updates, et cetera. Um, there's time pressure in this environment to mimic real world busyness. And they're told that there's a mail delivery robot in this building that's new and might periodically ask them for help. So we, we um, gather data on, in different circumstances, whether or not the person helps the robot. And we use this data to train a model of human help. Specifically, this model takes in the person's latent helpfulness, their current busyness at this time, and the robot's past frequency of asking them for help, where the latent helpfulness is an individual factor, the current busyness and the past frequency are contextual factors. The latent helpfulness, as I had mentioned, is unobservable. So this is actually something that the robot infers through its history of interacting with the person. And then the model outputs a probability of whether or not the person will help it. So as a model family for this, we use generalized linear mixed models with a logistic function. One of the big benefits of a model family like that for this problem is that it can jointly infer these unobserved variables, the values of these variables, as well as how it relates to the contextual factors in this model. So it's very powerful for a problem where some of the factors are observed, some of the factors are unobserved. So this is a graph of. Um, of what our model learned. I wish I had a laser pointer here, but fu fundamentally the x-axis is the busyness of the person, where zero is um, less busy, one is more busy. The y-axis is the model's predicted probability of helping, and each line is a different person. So as you can see, users actually span the gamut, right? The users at the bottom are basically never willing to help the robot, whereas the users at the top are willing to help the robot even as they get more busy. However, a model that only accounts for the contextual factors that doesn't individualize would be the black line, and it fails to capture that nuance. A model that only accounts for individual factors, not contextual factors, would be horizontal lines, right? It wouldn't account for the person's busyness. So we, um, we first evaluated this model on the collected data set using five-fold cross-validation with ANOVA. We compared our model, which is the hybrid model, to a model that only uses contextual factors, one that only uses individual factors, one that uses neither factor to complete that square, and a random forest model. Importantly, the individual model is the state of the art from the human helpfulness literature I'd mentioned earlier, and the random forest model is the state of the art approach from the human interruptibility research. So as you can see, our model significantly outperformed all the other models on both accuracy and F1 score. 
However, this is just the model's performance on a collected data set. How does this actually manifest in terms of robot behavior? So to investigate that, we integrated this approach into a Bayes Adaptive Markov Decision Process Planning Framework, where specifically the robot is trying to decide when it sees a person, should I ask them for help or should I not ask them for help? We then compared a, ran a user study comparing our model to baselines. And in this user study, the robot autonomously decided when to ask the person for help using the human help model. So here are our results. As you can see, our model significantly outperformed the baselines by 1.5x. And actually, when we break this down, our model received more help on average while asking for help 1.2x fewer times. So overall, this model is better at predicting when the person's likely to help and only asking for help then, using its social capital more effectively and not annoying people and leading them to not help it, hopefully. In summary, in this work, we developed a model of human health that disaggregated individual and contextual factors. We integrated that model into a planning framework that helped a robot decide when to ask for help. And we dis demonstrated the importance of both these factors in both an evaluation of the model as well as an evaluation of the planning framework. Future work includes deploying this a robot like this in the halls, which we kind of did last year, but we have to do a deeper dive into that, as well as considering different types of human helpers. Like, you know, if the robot has an in-person helper or a remote helper, who should it ask for help and why? Thank you, and if I have time, I'm happy to take questions. Yeah, you're right on the money with the timing. So yeah, there's two minutes for questions. Yeah. Deploy the model. What are the features that you will get to uh, compute the, the business score of a person? Do you see how fast they're walking, or if they're avoiding the robot purposefully? Yeah. So in this online environment, it was much easier because like we controlled all the variables, right? Um, so we knew how long they had to complete a task. We knew the minimum amount of time it would take, etc. In the real world, this is yet an open question. This is something we'd have to solve in order to deploy it effectively. Some of my hunches are. Perhaps we could look at walking speed. Perhaps we could look at, um, you know, like, are there, uh, is their face wandering when they're walking, for example? Are they, like, you know, carrying a notebook and a laptop, which could sometimes indicate going to a meeting? Another thing is actually in many office environments, like, your colleagues' calendars are visible, right? At UW, we can see when people have meetings, when they're busy or not. Um, so maybe if there's some way to identify individuals, which is crucial for this approach anyway, we could check, like, you know, hey, do they have a meeting coming up in the next 10 minutes, which could indicate busyness. And next up is uh, Michael, Michael Chung. Uh, he's advised, he was advised by Maya Chakmek, and uh, He's going to plug in. Oh, I was uh, off from the school for the last two years and completely forgot how the presentation worked. <laughs> um, my name is Mike. I, am, uh, uh, I was a graduate student at Maya's lab, uh, gra um, graduated in 2020, and currently works at an uh, industrial mobi mobile robot company called the uh, Vicarious. And uh, today I'm excited to present the uh, our work called the uh, Iterative Repair of Social Robot Programs from Implicit User Feedback via Bayesian Inference. Creating natural interactions for social robots is challenging. It requires a tedious and error-prone tuning of interactive program parameters. Per each robot's user who may change their behavior over time, demanding to repeat the uh, whole process to work again. Our goal is to facilitate fluent and autonomous social robot behavior authoring with an expressive yet maintainable approach, ideally by non-technical uh, users. To that end, uh, we propose an iterative process that incrementally repair program parameters using feedback provided by the uh, robot's user on the fly. It starts with a programmer writing a transition function program of a finite state machine representing the uh, robot behavior. behavior. Um, we introduce a domain-specific language that lets programmers to use holes in place of low-level details, such as sensor value thresholds and timing parameters, specified as uh, probability distributions. When ready, the program is executed on the robot, and the robot's user interacts with it the system then collects the interaction trace, such as 
FSM uh, finite state machine inputs, outputs, and states that are occurred during the interaction. If the holes are set to bad values, interaction breakdowns are likely to happen. For example, just now, the robot should have waited for the user, but moved on to asking the next question. There are two types of interaction breakdown uh, that we categorize. First one is the incorrect transition, which occurs when the robot makes a transition to a different state, or rather the next state, when it was supposed to remain in the same one. The user noticed the uh, problem and tapped go back button in that example to fix the uh, error and continue interacting with the robot. Another type is a missed transition, which occur when the robot remains in the same state when it was supposed to transition to a different, the next one. We assume uh, kind of scenarios we consider, in, in kind of scenarios we consider recovery mechanism like providing some adjustment button such as go back or next buttons will, uh, it will be always possible. Once the interaction is over, the programmer can spot the uh, breakdown by checking the robot's user input and correct the mismatch between the expected and recorded state trace to produce a corrected state trace. Alternatively, such corrections can be derived from the user's recovery input, freeing the programmer from the remaining repair process. The repair algorithm now uses the corrected state trace to improve the program by estimating the whole distributions. The process is iterative, and hence, our repair algorithm uses a Bayesian inference technique to efficiently update the distributions as more corrections become available. At high level, here is our um, algorithm. It starts with a program sketch K and sets a set of distribution over whole variable theta. For each iteration, it runs the program with the current whole variable, which might be wrong, and record traces of FSM inputs, I, and states O. The corrected state trace uh, is computed by using another algorithm, implicit state correction shown here, uh, which essentially derive corrections from the recorded tr traces and looking at the program structure uh, in the program uh, sketch, K. The core step of finding a better set of holes is done by taking a map estimation on posterior, di posterior di distribution over the holes. The posterior distribution is computed using the overlap between corrected state trace and candidate state trace as the uh, likelihood function. Finally, the prior for the next iteration is set to the uh, current posterior, allowing the uh, repeated uh, inference to be possible. The three core benefits of our approach are the, it allows programmers to use distributions to describe on certain part of the programs. It frees the programmers from having to be in the program maintenance loop by constructing a part of the repair objective from the data collected from the interaction, and makes the algorithm efficient for online setting that, are, that naturally reflects our target use case scenarios. We evaluate the third, second and third points as a part of our evaluation. To systematically evaluate the proposed algorithm, we created human simulators for sampling a large number of FSM input and ground truth state traces. We also created a more traditional search-based repair algorithm to use it as a baseline method, then compared the two algorithms over three social robot interaction scenarios over five repair uh, uh, iterations. We measured the interaction quality of each algorithm using the uh, percentage overlap between ground truth and the repaired program state trace as kind of a proxy and also measure the uh, speed of the algorithm uh, using the repair time. Our results show that the proposed algorithm performs nearly identical in the percentage overlap measure in all three scenarios. And in terms of speed, it outperforms the baseline as the Bayesian repair time remains at constant while 
the uh, baseline repair time increases linearly over the iterations. To test the full pipeline, we conducted human experiment with 10 participants and a custom-built social robot. The participants interacted with the uh, robot over four iterations, and we measured interaction quality using objective measures such as number of inter uh, interactions, breakdowns, and total interaction duration in seconds, assuming shorter is the, the better, and three subjective ratings questions uh, designed to measure perceived fluency of a uh, human-robot interaction. Our objective measure results show that the number of breakdown and total interaction du durations generally decreases over the interactions, uh, iterations. And as for the subjective measure, the average ratings of three perceived fluency questions increases, meaning they find it more fluent, uh, inter find the interactions to be more fluent over the uh, repair iterations. We have more results and uh, discussions in the full paper. And um, I would love to answer any questions if you had, have any. We probably have time for one question. We're a little bit over. Is there a question? Go ahead. Do you anticipate the benefits of this method scaling up as there are more modes of failure in an interaction problem? <laughs> it is a little bit tricky. Um, Failures that are useful, there, there are failures that are useful and there are failures that are not useful. So it's, it's a ratio of those uh, examples that we, can, uh, we collect during the iteration that helps the interaction. Um, and something I talk about in discussion briefly is spotting those two categories are difficult. And because of that, we would like to still keep the developers in the loop and uh, even then, debugging with the uh, system that involves a probability distributions and uh, these things are harder. So um, I s briefly propose some ideas for creating some tooling around for uh, to de uh, for developers to better identify useful examples. Uh, but yeah, it's it's complicated. Okay. Thank you. Uh, if, if that's okay, uh, one, one quick comment I want to make is uh, after school, um, I went to industry and uh, I would love to talk to anything about, um, I, I'm interested in talking about, uh, talking about bridging the gap between research and industry or finding your place to do uh, robotics or HRI work in uh, industry, which is harder than I thought it would be. Thanks. Uh, next up, we have Brian Zhang from uh, Naomi Fitter's lab again. All right. Hi, everybody. I'm Brian. I am a PhD candidate. I work with Professor Fitter in the Share Lab, and today I am presenting my recent work, uh, Bringing Wally Out of the Silver Screen, Understanding How Transformative Sound Affects Human Perception. Robots in the media often use transformative sound, and you might recognize robot movie so uh, stars by their characteristic sounds, such as Wally's. as well as R2-D2. These popular robots use sound, sometimes coupled with their motion, to help convey their intent and their state to an audience. But in the real world, robots very rarely use this kind of sound. Instead, robots usually only have consequential sound, which is the sound they produce as a natural consequence of their operation and their motion, like motor sounds. Transformative sound, such as the vocable sounds of these robots from the media, require more investigation to see if they would be helpful for robots to use in real life. Transformative sound we defined as a form of non-linguistic intentional sound that's used to complement a robot's natural sound profile. It's common for robots in the media, as we said, um, but very uncommon for robots in the real world. However, there are some exceptions, uh, particularly for robots that are specifically meant for personal or social use, such as the Cosmo robot, which we see here on the right. Using the Cosmo robot and several other robots, we wanted to answer the question, does, how does transformative sound affect humans' perceptions of robots? 
We selected a wide variety of robots across different spaces, including the Now robot, the TurtleBot 2, Baxter, and UR5V. We did this because we wanted to examine robots in both social and non-social contexts, as well as in different form factors to see if people would still perceive transformative sound in a similar way. Um, we, for each of these robots, we recorded the robot performing four different motions, and then we had uh, music or sound designers and musicians from the author team develop transformative sounds to overlay onto these robots. One exception to that is Cosmo, because it has built-in transformative sound. We used it as a sort of professionally designed control sample to see if our artist design sounds would perform at a similar level. Here are some of the examples of the behaviors we used in the studies and with the original and the transformed sounds. This is the Cosmo without any transformative sound. And with. The Now robot. Classic. I listened to this for several days. The TurtleBot 2 was partially uh, responsible for inspiring this research. So using these stimulus videos, as well as the others for each robot, we created a series of five online within subjects based studies. Each had a target sample of about 100 based on a power analysis we did, um, and we recruited from Amazon Mechanical Turk. After providing their consent to participate in the study, uh, we had them complete a loudness calibration video to set their volume at a loud but comfortable level. And they also completed a calibration stimulus, which actually featured the Cassie robot. Um, in order to get a baseline expectation of their response to sounds and also prepare them for the survey format in the future. Then they watched each of the eight stimuli for a robot in a semi-random order, punctuated by attention checks in the middle and the end, provided the reasoning behind their responses of the main factors and a free response question, uh, made sure they were actually paying attention through a manipulation check to make sure they could distinguish between two videos, and then lastly completed the negative attitudes towards robot scale and a demographic survey. The main analysis we completed was um, examining their responses to each individual stimulus. Uh, for each stimulus, we measured certain variables on the, P or on the survey participants' or perception of the robot in the videos. First was the valence and energy level from the circumflex model of affect, as well as the warmth, competence, and discomfort sales from the uh, robot social attribute scale. With these five measures, uh, we analyzed them with two factor repeated measure or yeah, repeated measure ANOVAs. And for significant ANOVAs, we performed uh, corrected pairwise comparisons using home bomb only corrections. What we found was that uh, the provided sounds were generally 
capable of are improving all of the measures that we measured except for discomfort. So the professionally designed sounds, for instance, on the Cosmo, uh, provided a pretty reasonable benefit to the valence, energy level, warmth, and competence. We did find that our artist design sounds uh, for the Chartabot 2 were very similarly effective, uh, which was nice to see, also increasing valence, energy level, warmth, and competence. It was particularly interesting because the Turtlebot was not performing any social actions, didn't have any social features like the Cosmo did, but still received the similar benefits. And our remaining artist design sounds had similar effects, though usually slightly smaller in effect size and um, fewer significant pairwise comparisons. The UR5E had the same improved metrics, while the Now robot uh, received everything except for energy level. And lastly, the Baxter's transformative sounds increased all of the metrics except for discomfort, which it actually decreased, so very good across the board, although smaller effect sizes, as said before. Overall, our work shows that transformative sound has promise for all kinds of robots, regardless of whether they're acting in a social capacity explicitly or not. Uh, while online studies in these cases help to survey many robots very quickly and with plenty of statistical power, uh, we plan on confirming our studies through uh, in-person, or confirming our findings through in-person studies. This work will also help us build tools for roboticists and sound designers to collaborate more easily, uh, and we highly recommend that roboticists work together with sound designers and musicians to implement transformative sound on their own robots. The design safe for found is quite large and very difficult to tackle on your own. Overall, the main takeaway from this is that transformative sound is an important component of human-robot interaction. It does warrant further investigation, there's a lot of ways we could integrate this into multimodal interactions as well. Thank you very much for your time, and I'd be happy to take any questions. Great, thank you. Question over here. Um, so some of your sounds were like communicating an emotional state of the robot, like with the Cosmo, whereas yeah. like with the Turtlebot, it seemed more like announcing its present, just presence, just like playing while it's going around. Yes. And I'm curious if you have thoughts on like the differences between these in terms of both how they should be used as well as how they could be perceived. Yes. Um, yeah, that's, that's the, um, like a continuing thread in our research, I think. Um, basically, there's, there's certain things that you would want to communicate through sound and certain things that could become annoying if they're continually communicated through sound. And there's definitely also a suitability factor of whether, um, you know, the, the appearance or the action of a robot matches up with the sounds that it creates. Um, one way that we saw that actually was uh, with the now robot, there was one of the actions, the action shown in the video, was um, it acting scared. And that's actually uh, kind of weird because, you know, our measures were measuring stuff like how happy does the robot seem or how warm, right? Um, and so um, we still saw an increase in, in happiness or warmth perception despite that, you know, the sounds were supposed to communicate scared. So there's... Um, there's certain things or certain cases where it may be preferable to just be as silent as possible. Um, and so the absence of sound is also a design feature. Yeah. Thanks. Yep. All right. Well, we're over time, but let's take one more question and then we'll wrap up. Yeah, great talk. Um, do you have any thoughts on how you might be able to merge together the transformative sound and those incidental sounds? How could they work together to give an impression? Yeah, actually, we are, we, uh, where we have several papers under review for this. Um, but we're trying to develop a system that basically integrates the, um, the, the sensor data and, and preferably semantic level descriptions of robot actions directly into the sound generation side of it so that you would um, really be able to easily create um, especially non-repetitive sounds that couple very tightly with the actions that they're supposed to. Yep. Cool. Okay. Well, that was great talk. Thank you. Um, we should get the next speaker up. Uh, and Bola Yang is a PhD student here at UWCSC, and he is working with me. All right. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Bola Yang, and uh, I'm a grad student here. Uh, in this project, I'm working with Gonets, Byron, and uh, Josh. Oh, and Patrick. <laughs> um, so in this paper, uh, we explore the novel idea of competitive human-robot interaction. Uh, as the first step to work this idea, we make a robot companion that makes physical exercise fun and effective. So, um, in this paper, we first discuss the signif significance of competitive interaction and justify why we believe that it deserves increased attention from the robotics community. 
we then, we then create a robotic system for competitive HRI research. We use a multi-agent reinforcement learning method to train our robot to play a competitive fencing game with actual human users. And finally, we perform two user studies with 16 actual human subjects to evaluate the system's effectiveness, uh, users' acceptance toward our system, and uh, the system effects on human learning. All right, so why do we even care about competitive interaction? Indeed, there has been a lot of uh, research in human-robot um, cooperation, but not too much on competition. But when we take a closer look at competition, or healthy competition, uh, from a psychological perspective, we'll find that they actually have a very positive effects uh, on us, or, or uh, beneficial to us. So, psychologist has found that um, in in a large uh, in in a large range of setting, uh, from from a video game to uh, different kinds of physical exercise, um, the introduction the introduction of com competition actually um, highly motivates highly motivates the participants and eventually resulted in uh, increased performance. So. Um, so uh, we, in HRI, we basically we can try to avoid unhealthy competitions that narrowly and overly focus on winning, and we imagine that a robot competitor could be motivative and could potentially inspire our improvement in a given task. Um, moreover, creating a robot that can compete with a human physically is actually a very challenging uh, control problem. Um, the robot needs to constantly reason about the human's intent and strategically control its high degree of freedom body to counteract the opponent's uh, adversarial behavior while maximizing its own rewards. So with these uh, technical challenges in mind, we designed this um, zero-sum attack and defense game as the evaluation environment for our system and the user studies. We call it the fencing game. So, each fencing game lasts for 20 seconds. And so we have two players in the game where um, the antagonist on the right uh, aims to uh, attack the target area, uh, which is the orange spherical area between the two players. So for every time steps that it meant, uh, the antagonist managed to put this uh, sword within the target area, it will get one point. On the other hand, the protagonist player on the left aims to minimize the antagonist scores by giving him a penalty. So um, whenever the antagonist uh, places sword within the target area, but simultaneously make contact with the protagonist sword, um, he will get a negative 10 points of penalty. Meaning that basically the antagonist need to uh, uh, attack the target area, but at the same time try to dodge the uh, protagonist sword. And additionally, um, the, an, uh, the antagonist will get 10 points of reward if the protagonist sword is placed within the target area, uh, passively waiting for the antagonist to attack for more than two seconds. This will encourage the robots to play the game more proactively instead of just camping around the target area. Okay, so, um, Given this research problem, now let's briefly talk about uh, how do we create a robot competitor uh, with a PR2 robot. So, um, to create robot policy that can play the fencing game sufficiently well, we formulate this uh, fencing game as a multi-agent Markov game problem and solve it with a two-player, uh, sorry, solve it with a two-phase multi-agent PPO algorithm. The first phase of the algorithm can be seen as a pre-training process where uh, in, this, in this training phase, we use reward shaping. We don't have the video, sorry. Yeah, so in this phase of training, we, we use reward shaping and an iterative training scheme that allows each agent to uh, learn a best response against the most recent opponents. Um, this allows the agents to learn to move and understand the game rule uh, uh, very quickly. However, this kind of best response updates in multi-agent systems are known to be uh, unstable. 
uh, because all agents are rapidly changing their policy um, and and such that their policy updates might be just chasing each other in circles and never converge. So uh, we we use a second phase of training to create more, sophistic more sophisticated policy with a different reward and sampling uh, strategy. So in the second phase, the agents are rewarded solely with the game scores, which encourages uh, better exploration in their parameter space. Um, in each iteration, um, one agent will play against a random version of the opponents from the history, uh, which basically diversifies the training samples. And this new reward and sampling strategies allows the agents to learn a more complex behavior and improve the convergence property. And to make, to make the learn policy work well uh, in both the simulation and the real world setting, we choose to control our PR2 robots with a Jacobian transpose and effector controller. And we perform system identification to tune the parameter of both the controller and the um, simulation model, such that the N effector dynamics of the simulated robots and the real robots are similar. Um, for experiments, we performed two user studies to evaluate the system's effectiveness uh, from, from three different perspectives. Uh, we monitor the user's uh, heart rates uh, in game, and then we also assess to um, uh, the, the, the human subjects uh, subjective opinion towards our system with a modified technology acceptance model. And finally, we also monitor um, the human's learning effects in game. So um, for, for the heart rate, uh, before experiments, we record the average uh, heart rate for each subject while they are working f walking for like three minutes uh, around the lab uh, as a baseline value. And we found that uh, subjects' uh, heart rates in, in more than 92% of the games were higher than the baselines. And their heart rates in one third of these games are actually uh, quite significantly higher than the baseline. So we're talking about like 20% to 58% higher, uh, which is a little surprising because um, during the game, the participants was asked to uh, keep their feet planted on the ground and just play the game with their upper body moving. So their physical maneuverability was very limited. Um, so we were curious about this, and later we uh, look into their sub uh, subjective response. And we found that the increase of heart rate also correlates to the, uh, to the cognitive effort and some noticeable emotional uh, reactions that were triggered by the game such as frustration, uh, motivation, uh, excitement, and intimidation. And uh, we also have a high acceptance uh, to, the, to, 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 to our system and the game, where uh, most people, uh, most participants uh, think our system were entertaining, and they would like to uh, think, think, also think it's effective and uh, can improve the quality of their uh, physical exercise and would like to uh, interact with the robots in the future. So finally we compare, um, finally we compare our RL train policy with a strong heuristic policy and we found that uh, subjective, uh, um, we found that um, it is actually significantly more challenging for the subjects to learn, uh, learn to make improvement over time uh, for when playing against the RL policy and the subjects think the RL train policy were actually more intelligent because of its defensive and diverse behavior. I'm sorry that the, the video doesn't work, but you can uh, try to find the video up there. And yeah. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. We, we don't have time for questions. So Alan Sanchez, uh, who's working with Bill Smart, in the Personal Robotics Lab at OSU. It's going to be the final speaker of this session. Mucho gusto. Alan Giovanni Sanchez in the Personal uh, Robotics Group at Oregon State University, where I am advised by Professor Smart. And this is my presentation, a shared autonomy surface disinfection system using a mobile manipulator robot. Uh, so within this presentation, I'm going to discuss the design, implementation, and testing of an ultraviolet germicidal irradiation system or UVGI system that we implemented on a fetch mobile manipulator robot. 
And I will also discuss our work that we focused on the parameters of uh, the path pathogen that was, res was responsible for the Ebola virus disease, uh, specifically the Sudan strain. So let's go ahead and get into it. Uh, so within the past decade, harmful viruses such as Ebola, MERS, and as well as COVID-19 uh, have resulted in severe health hazards to healthcare facilities worldwide. Uh, this is uh, mainly because of the risk of virus transmission for healthcare workers when they are treating their patients. So for instance, in uh, Liberia, 8% of the healthcare workforce died uh, from Ebola, and this is because um, their work workers were habitually around these contaminated surfaces and areas. So uh, thus, you know, surface disinfection can actually play an important role in mitigating this vir uh, virus transmission. And an approach is to use semi-autonomous robots to help disinfect and create the environment, uh, a safer environment for the workers. Um, there's various benefits for using UVGI uh, robots, uh, repeatable and accurate motions. They work in various environmental conditions and as well can provide consistent and effective uh, surface disinfection. Now, a method uh, uh, to com for combating viruses is exposing surfaces to UV light, which inactivates uh, viruses, and this is also known as ultraviolet germicidal irradiation. Uh, so the image here you see on the left is, is a common design for UV robots. And essentially what you have is a column of UVC lamps mounted on a mobile base where a human supervisor then uh, designates areas on a map for that robot to go ahead and disinfect. Um, some of the limitations for the design, however, is um, uh, shadowing effects. So sometimes the robot may inadvertently miss some surfaces. Now, a method uh, to address this limitation is to actually have the UVC light um, source mounted on the arm of a mobile manipulator robot. So here we have the Adams robot at USC. Uh, this is a teleoperator robot that maneuvers the UV wand across intricate shaped objects and surfaces on a table. And uh, it's a great teleoperating robot, but the thing about teleoperating robots is sometimes you might lose uh, performance, right? Especially when it's a high degree uh, freedom arm and a bit challenging to control. So uh, at the time of this writing uh, for this paper, the uh, there hasn't been really been systems that modeled or as well quantify the amount of UV dose provided by a mobile manipulator robot. Uh, so when it comes to disinfection, it's, it's um, invariably a log logarithmic uh, process. And here we have our first order decay rate model for UV disinfection, where S is our survival rate, which is essentially the uh, ratio of active viruses after and before disinfection. And then we have our UV rate constant, which is essentially the resistance of a pathogen may have for, uh, from UV uh, um, exposure. And this is gonna vary for various viruses because of their di diverse genome type. Uh, D is the UV exposure, which is the, essentially the amount of wattage accumulated over time for a given surface. Now, the image here on the right is a, is a curve fit model of the UV exposure dose and survival for the Klebs liffer um, bacillus virus. And here what I want to highlight is when there is a survival fraction of 0.1, uh, this is also expressed as a disinfection of 90% or D subscript 90 because 10% of the virus is still active. Um, so uh, the equation on the left, we can actually rearrange uh, to get uh, the equation in terms of, oh, UV exposure in terms of uh, survival and UV rate constant. And we also know that UV exposure can be defined as um, E subscript T times I subscript R, where I of R is the irradiance provided by a UV light source, and E subscript T is the, amount, uh, the, ex the exposure time. Now, why is this important? Because this actually allows us to understand, th this allows us to uh, know how long we should shine our UV light on a surface for a specific virus, right? So uh, this known times allows us to uh, know when the man manipulator should move from waypoint to waypoint. So for our design layout, uh, first what we want to do is model our world and show that to our human supervisor, uh, where that human supervisor then defines a plane and other parameters, uh, as I mentioned, like disinfection rate or the UV rate constant of the virus. Uh, then our path planner generates these waypoints in the 2D plane uh, that you see the rear plane right there. Uh, those are then transferred back to 3D points, which are uh, visualized for the human, su human supervisor. And if, uh, if approved, then the path is then executed by our robot manipulator. Now, I previously mentioned uh, our pathfinding algorithm for our manipulator velocity. There are three characteristics that we look at. It's our disinfection rate, 
our UV rate constant and our UV light distribution. Now, ideally, we would want uh, the radiance across the lit surface to be uniform, but uh, we didn't get that from um, our UV light. Uh, so we used a kernel mask of our radiance values to represent the light distribution on the surface. And then for our modeling, what we wanted to do was to span that kernel mask across a larger matrix that accumulates the amount of irradiance uh, for a given time. And the value of each cell um, in the accumulatory radio will represent the UV dose it has received from our uh, UV flashlight. Uh, for our UV flashlight, we actually had a wavelength of 365 nanometers. Uh, it's in the A band. I don't necessarily want to be around UVC uh, when doing these tests, so this is safer a proxy for, uh, for human testing. And we use the digital meter to measure the radiance um, distances from the center of the UV exposure area you see here on the image on the left. And the graph on the right illustrates that data. Um, you notice that there's actually a, a lump uh, or non-uniform, and thus was, it was really important for us to use this kernel mask approach. And from our data, we were actually able to create a kernel mask of our UV flashlight. And uh, as for our physical results, uh, as, as mentioned, we tested around the parameters of the Ebola sedan strain. Uh, now, the required UV dose for disinfection for this is uh, at a disinfection rate of 90%, is 27 joules per meter squared. Uh, now, to test the UV dose, uh, accumulation, we created a, a sensor array to measure the amount of UV, uh, UV uh, irradiance from our UV flashlight, which you'll see in this little quick video. Uh, you can actually see the UV flashlight. Oh, sorry, went a bit early. Um, so you can see the flashlight flying on the table, but on the table, uh, you can see our UV array, and on the top right, you will see our, our sensors measuring each of the each measuring its irradiance, and the red line being the required uh, UV dose for disinfection, which all the sensors measure above. Um, here are our physical results. Uh, so one thing you notice is that there's a lot more irradiation from the beginning of our sensor array and then towards the end, which makes sense because the dynamics of the robotic arm. As it's trying to get to that desired velocity, it needs to speed up, and then when it's trying to make a complete stop, it, of course, slows down. Uh, so some of the limitations of our design is the uh, current implementation uh, depends on the assumption of planar surfaces. Uh, the dynamics as well as the manipulator cause a dose saturation on several of the UV sensors, uh, as we just saw. And then also the UV uh, emission of the flashlight, uh, our flashlight itself, drops uh, after several minutes. So there's essentially a power drop. Uh, so that was some of the limitations of our design. Um, uh, for future work, uh, we, we, to further build off the first set that we, for work that we did was we want to look at how to optimize the trajectory uh, for the pan plath Currently, we're thinking of uh, having three different test cases uh, that will provide a different tool path for the end effector. Uh, on the right, in the, oh, the, the first being that we have the path of a fixed height based on the highest point of an object on the table, uh, similar on the image you see here. Um, the second is to actually have a changing height of the end effector uh, with respect to the surface uh, that you see in the image here. And then our third uh, test case would be actually to have the end effector uh, set distance uh, along the surface normal. And for the observations that we're trying to look for is the time of completion for a toolpath as well as the irradiance coverage for our toolpath and, um, and then compare our results and you know, hopefully raise more questions about what we see. And then uh, also another uh, direction we're looking at is using a heat camera to determine commonly used items within the lab space. Uh, this will help us develop a, a heat map of, of uh, information that we can then determine whether, how or when to disinfect uh, commonly used items within this lab. Uh, we're thinking also to explore using this in um, uh, hospitals and as well as retirement homes close in the Corvallis area. So that's something we're really excited to explore on. Uh, this was funded by the NIH and that was pretty quick, but I did the best that I can. <laughs> okay, so we pretty much used all the time, but let's take one quick question. I was wondering if you had considered sort of like, it seems like your search space is like a plane above the table. Yeah. I was wondering if you had considered like expanding that into a three-dimensional space. So like you go further away, but you just like wait like three times as long. 
you hit the whole table with one blast. Yeah, so that's something that we're trying to explore with the, the optimization. Would it make sense if we just have, you know, one point, uh, yeah, a certain high point? But then, then that also raises the question, that we're going to have the same shadowing effects that, you know, the UVC mobile uh, robots that encounter? So that's why we're going to explore also not only just height change, but also orientation, see if we can get those, uh, those type uh, or those, those uh, shadowing effects uh, addressed. Okay, thank you. Okay, so now we have a break, uh, and we'll start back up at 11.